We are uh, in our midst of our summer uh, preaching schedule, and I'm looking at uh, some of the prophets uh, of the Old Testament, and uh, today, Joel, last week, uh, we talked a little out of Micah, and then um, next week, out of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's a rather long book, so we're just going to do one message out of it, but it has to do with God reviving these bones and bringing life out of death, so that's going to be next week's message. And then a little bit of a shift in schedule. So on July 16th, we're going to have a Youth Sunday. And it's going to be a wonderful time to hear stories uh, of our our young people's uh, lives and ministry. Not only from parts of the mission trip, I think, but but the uh, 30-hour famine that they'll be having that weekend. And and some other things. And a baptism. So lots going on. And then uh, the rest of July and on into August, we'll start doing some study in the book of Jeremiah. So... You can begin reading ahead on some of those. As some of you may be familiar with that uh, rather uh, poignant commentary. It was written by Martin Niemöller. Uh, Niemöller was a German, uh, German Lutheran pastor. He was uh, arrested by the Gestapo and sent to Dachau concentration camp, and that was in 1938. Amazingly, he survived that experience, and he was set free by the Allied troops in 1945. But out of that horrible trauma, Niemöller wrote these very haunting words, and I think they've been quoted so many times that I think many of us already know them. He said, in Germany, the Nazis came for the Jews, and I did not speak up because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. And then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. And then they came for me, and by that time, there was no one left to speak up for me. When the word of the Lord came to Joel, Joel spoke up. He spoke up to his people. And like many of the other Old Testament prophets, Joel spoke up in a time of terrible crisis. The immediate crisis was an extraordinarily severe plague of locusts combined with a drought which had destroyed most of the crops upon which their food supply depended. And it was so severe that it affected the harvest for over a year. The very survival of God's people in Judah and Jerusalem was now in question. In the locust invasion, Joel saw an even greater danger prefigured. He saw the approach of the day of the Lord. We, we mentioned that in, uh, in Joel 1 verse 15. This approach of the day of the Lord. That day when God would allow a fearsome army in judgment on his wayward people. His people, uh, as you might recall, remained outwardly religious, but their hearts strayed from God himself. This phrase, the day of the Lord, is one of the central elements in Joel's prophecy. It's mentioned no less than five times. Joel spoke to wake up his people so that they would realize that they are in grave danger of even remaining alive. And then he exhorted them to return to the Lord with all their hearts and to pray that the Lord would spare them. And finally, Joel spoke God's word of encouragement to them, not only talking about repentance, but also restoration. Now, since the book of Joel is situated between two other books, Hosea and Amos, in our Old Testament, Uh, we might be tempted to think that Joel's ministry happened in around the 8th century B.C. with those other prophets. The only reference in the book, though, that may indicate something of a date is found in Joel 3, 2, where God, through this prophet, says that he's going to judge the nations because those nations scattered my people among all the nations and divided up my land. And many scholars believe that is actually a reference to the Babylonian exile, which happened more in the 6th century. But nobody can be sure. Perhaps it's just as well, since the message of Joel has a timeless application. 
The people of God in every generation continue to be faced with crises and times of trial not much different than in Joel's day. And so the book of Joel speaks across the centuries to all of God's people in every trying time. Now, Joel was absolutely convicted of the message God called him to share. This message was not something that he made up, you know, in his own imagination. It comes with a sense of divine authority and weight. Joel was motivated by a specific concern, and that concern is, what will we tell our children? How will we interpret this tragedy to future generations? Nothing like this has ever happened before. How is God with us in this devastating experience? So let's face the fact that difficulties do come to us as well. People of faith uh, don't have immunity from devastation. The locusts did not devour the crops of the wicked and bypass the fields of the faithful. Jesus told us that the sun shines and the rain falls on the good and the bad alike. Even when his own son had to suffer, there was no magical escape for Jesus. No angels protected his back from the whip and no mysterious anesthetic softened the pain of the cross. Jesus faced suffering and death like everyone else. The locusts come to all of us. The locusts come to all of us. And one day each of us will cry, as Joel says in, in 1.8, like a, a young girl who mourns the death of the man she was going to marry. The time will come and all of us will look on helplessly as, as our crops are destroyed, Joel 1.16. It's a universal part of the human experience to feel that there has never been anything like this and there never will be again. And so let me ask, how will we or how do we interpret the coming of the locusts in the light of our faith? What can we learn when we face suffering and loss? Two realities come, come to surface in this book. First, we can repent. We can change our lives and our ways right now. We can reorient the direction of our living. Sometimes, you know, cartoons are, are made to make us laugh. But sometimes there are cartoons that, that really, you know, kind of poke us in our pretentious religious ribs. You know what I'm talking about? One was a beautiful, uh, this cartoon of a beautiful cathedral. And people are streaming out of this church, streaming out of this cathedral, jubilantly carrying the priests on their shoulders. I can't imagine you doing that with me. <laughs> carrying Pastor Jeff outside the church. But they're carrying their priests on their shoulders and they're so happy and excited, you know, his robes and stoles are flapping in the breeze. And there's two men standing off to the side watching this amazing display of enthusiasm. And one of them says, what happened in there? And the other says, oh, he just said sin doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> How excited they were. I would guess that pastor didn't get the message from Joel. For Joel, the very reason for the coming of the locusts was because of the people's sin. And so for the prophet, the devastation becomes a, a, an occasion to confess. An opportunity for honest to goodness repentance. A change of heart, a renewal, if you will, of faith and commitment. Have you ever thought to yourself, oh my, we are living in such frank times I mean, isn't it true today that nothing is kept under wraps anymore? 
people will admit to almost anything, and if not, they will make up just about anything and tell you that instead. We see people on national TV bragging about, or social media, bragging about their, their numerous like marriage failures or admitting that they're living together and have been for years and are sexually active and, and they laugh about their use of drugs or, or alcohol. And then the audience laughs and applauds. See, our problem is not that we hesitate to admit anything. Our problem is that we're learning how to justify everything. And we have unbelievable excuses for just anything we do. And Joel, the prophet, would not put up with our nonsense. In view of the horrific calamity which has come upon the land that he describes so eloquently in chapter 1, verse 4, Joel summons the nation to a time of lamentation before he calls them to repentance. He wants them to feel the pain of this tragedy of the nation and to feel that they have brought it on themselves. He wants them to say in so many words, I just don't know where to turn. I don't know where to go. How many of you have ever said those words? You know, you get to the end of your endurance and you think to yourself, now what do I do? I don't know where to go. I don't know who to talk to. What do I do now? We face seemingly impossible problems that stretch us beyond our understanding and our ability to cope. All of the Alternatives, all the alternatives seem so unacceptable and unworkable. And it's precisely at times like that, when we have reached the end, that Joel tells us where to turn. I love the way Eugene Peterson puts this in his rendition called The Message. Joel 2 at verse 13, Eugene Peterson puts it this way. Change your life, not just your clothes. Come back to God, your God. And here's why. God is kind. God is merciful. God takes a deep breath, puts up with a lot. This most patient God, extravagant in love, always ready to cancel catastrophe. Who knows? Maybe he'll do it now. Maybe he'll turn around and show pity. Maybe when all is said and done, there will be blessings full and robust for your God. People of ancient times, you know, they were used to uh, tearing at their clothes as a sign of anguish. Rend your garments, tear your garments when you would lament. But Joel tells his people to tear at their heart, their lives, and not their garments because the observance of religious ritual is just not enough. Heart is the source of moral strength. And God desires the total reorientation of a person's inner life. Then, and only then, may God have pity and turn and give his aid. Now, according to Joel, the initiative is always with God. This is good news. Our repentance is possible only because of the graciousness of God. Joel was uh, writing to a people who wanted to live their lives as they pleased and commit whatever sins they wanted to commit. They just assumed that when they were ready to repent, well, God was obligated to respond with his grace and mercy. Dietrich Bonhoeffer had a word for that. He called that cheap grace. You know, it's kind of like when you plan to sin because you plan that God will forgive you. Be careful now. Joel says that may not be the case. Our repentance does not move God to do anything. God moves us to repent. See, the initiative is always his. And whatever we do towards God is always in response to something God has already done 
for us. You may know of someone who is committing sin, maybe like it's going out of style today, and, and with all your heart, you know that person needs. They need God, and they need to repent. What you can do is to pray that God will, will melt that person's heart and soften their heart and remove their pride and bring that person to a point of genuine repentance. Pray. Because the initiative is always with God. And then the second reality is uh, we can receive God's restoration. Receive God's restoration. That's what Holy Communion is all about, you know, on a day like today, for us to come forward and to, to let God know in response to what he has done for us that, that we want our lives to be fashioned after his. That's, that's part of repentance. But then to receive this bread and this juice and to know that we are, we are having a life intermingled with Christ spiritually. And we draw sustenance and strength and newness through that. We receive God's restoration. In Joel 2 at verse 25, the Lord says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. You will have plenty to eat until you are full. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. And then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again. Will my people be shamed? You see, here the Lord promises to re repay his people for the annual harvests of those years that they were devastated by the locust invasion. Verses 26 and 27 present the results of the restitution offered in verse 25. The harvest will again be plentiful enough for the people to eat and always be satisfied. The people will praise the name of the Lord their God and they will recognize the source of their sustenance. And never again will they be put to shame. Times of loss, times of grief or devastation always can be times for you and for me to rediscover the mercy of God. Woody White tells of the day he was called from a meeting to go to his mother's small, very humble apartment in the city. Thieves had broken into her house, had stolen her possessions, had physically uh, beaten her. He said that when he walked in the door and he took his mother into his arms, out of her long years of faith in the face of suffering, she said to him, Woody, God is still good. God is still good. The miracle of faith is not that you and I escape from suffering, but rather the discovery of God's grace in the midst of it. For those who have nurtured a growing relationship with God, the devastation may be the occasion to realize anew the constant love that God has for us. A love that is deeper and stronger and longer lasting than our human loss and pain. I think it was Corey Ten Boom, who also was a prisoner of war uh, in, in a Nazi concentration camp. It was Corey Ten Boom who said something like this, no matter how deep the suffering in your life, God is deeper still. Author George Carter about 20 years ago, wrote a contemporary rendition of Joel's words. And uh, I felt that they would be very appropriate for, for us today on this weekend this, uh, where we look ahead to July 4th and we remember our own independence. Uh, these words of Joel's rewritten in a contemporary style that uh, George Carter called the oracle in the style of Joel. Here's what he says. O oh, people of America, go tell your children and your children's children that the day of the Lord is at hand. The armies of death and destruction are moving toward us with breakneck speed. Our streets are under constant attack from the locusts of greed and jealousy and poverty and lewd behavior and disrespect and passivity. Our family structures are being torn down by the evil demolition crews of the adversary. America, our leaders are under attack individually and collectively. 
Many leaders have been blinded by clouds of ambition and pride, unable to see the error of their ways and the ineffectiveness of their legislation. Indeed, the need to pass laws seems to outweigh the need for them. People of the living God, behold that the day of the Lord is at hand. Those who practice ungodliness and unholiness will be forever lost. Like the inhabitants of Edom, the time will come when those who refuse to repent will be no more. But for those who endure to the end, the mercy and joy of your God and my God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, will be with you. The spirit of the living God has been poured out on the world. O oh, America, be counted among the believers in Christ Jesus. Come to know the truth of who Jesus is and what he is to this dying world. And let your children know, beyond the shadow of any doubt, let them know that you exist only because of the grace of God. Let your children know that the prayers of the righteous avail much. Let your children know that they too must tell their generation after generation about the goodness of the Lord. And so friends, when God interrupts our lives with a plague of locusts, be they times of loss or grief, or devastation, look at it in part as an invitation to accept those times as an occasion to repent and to be restored. And if you do that, God will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. Let's pray. God, we come to you today with a full admission of of our just sort of taking for granted your grace. And sometimes we just go strolling along through life, not paying a whole lot of attention to the consequences of what we do and think and feel and, and your reaction to it all. And then Joel speaks to us and tells us to wake up and to see all of our life and all of our lives and our nation and our world in the light of who you are and your eternal plans and purposes. And we can only come now and bow in repentance, ask your forgiveness, and seek your restorative grace. Bring us to this table today to encounter your love and your mercy and receive your strength again and restore us to be your people in Jesus' name.